Hi, it's Mrs Kirby. I've just come on tonight to read you the last two chapters of our book, The Boy Who Grew Dragons by Andy Shepherd. Now we have loved this book in 3K and I thought that it's best to finish it off together. We've only got two chapters left. Now, if you can remember, Thomas and his friends had been to the tree and picked their own dragon fruit and they'd all ended up with their own dragon. There was a golden dragon, there was a dragon that had icicles that was hanging off its chin, although they weren't icicles, they were actually spikes. There was one of the dragons that had peacock coloured scales all over it that looked like peacock feathers. And then there was Flicker, Thomas's dragon. So let's see what they do with the dragon. This was the picture that was on the page just before we finished. So that's, I think it's Ted with his golden dragon. And we're going to carry on with chapter 25, Grand High Dragon Master. If you think that four dragons and four people in a two-man tent would be a bit of a squash, you'd be right. It was a nightmare, in fact. The dragons had been quite dozy at first, so carrying them back at the moonlit garden was a piece of cake. But it wasn't long before they started to wriggle and wanted to stretch their wings. Luckily, I knew how to calm them down, or I thought I did. I told the others to come prepared with a shoebox and some broccoli, and because of my status as chief dragon expert, they'd actually followed my orders. I felt as if I could get used to this. My role as respected elder, the voice of experience and wisdom, leading my minions. Perhaps they could call me something like commander or captain. Perhaps even grand high dragon master. Yeah, that sounded good. I'd probably need a cloak or a special hat maybe and a logo. Definitely a logo. Oi, Earth to planet Thomas, said Ted, poking me in the side. Shaking out of my daydream. I saw Ted pulling his daftest face at me. Come on, Pongtastic. What do you think? He said. I waved goodbye to the vision of myself as Grand High Dragon Master. Who was I kidding? There was no way Ted was going to call me Grand High anything, except Pongmaster, maybe. He was holding out his shoebox to me, and I have to admit, the little imp called Envy started muttering away in my head when I saw it. He painted it in this really cool design with bright shots of orange flames at the sides and it was like a black silky cloth and it was lined with a black silky cloth. Turning around, I saw Cat and Kai cradling theirs. It looked as if everyone had gone to town on the decorating. Cat had a soft velvet scarf for her dragon to curl up in and the box itself was painted and covered in shiny sticky back gems. A line of rubies and diamonds spelled out the words top secret. If that wasn't guaranteed to make somebody go in for a nose around, I don't know what would. Kai, who tended to have a lot less pension, pension, patience for anything arty crafty, for any arty crafty stuff, had just painted his a dark green. But even he had decked it out with some kind of fleecy material. They all look way more inviting than Flicker's shoebox. Right, cool, I said, feeling pretty pleased that I'd managed to ignore my little envious imp who had been all ready to stomp off in a huff and having been outdone. I was glad because everybody seemed really chuffed that I thought they were up to scratch. And then they started quizzing me on what we should do next. I guess I was still Grand High Dragon Master after all, even without a hat. Food and sleep, I told them. That's what, ne that's what is next. Get your box and your broccoli ready. Flicker flew down and tried to pick up the broccoli stalk I was holding. Let's see if we can entice them in. If they're anything like Flicker, they must be hungry by now. The dragons were hungry but it was soon clear that Flicker was on his own. When it came to loving all things greeny and sprouty, Flicker was the only one. Ted's dragon appeared to have a taste for, well, anything and everything. He'd already found and demolished a chocolate fudge bar that must have fallen out of Ted's pocket, 
plus most of its shiny wrapper, an apple and some crisps, which Ted assured us he had been saving to share with us later. The dragon was now surrounded by what appeared to be the remains of several small insects and a hairy, half-chewed marshmallow, and it was biting off and swallowing the button on Cat's cardigan. With every bite his, he took, his belly pulsed with a fiery orange glow that rippled down through his tail as though flames were sizzling through him. Cheeky thing, Ted said. He's just munched all our, on all of our provisions. You're just mad because he's got to them before you could, I said with a laugh. Cat leaned across, trying to reach her dragon, who had settled by the edge of her sleeping bag. I've got a picture to show you. I think it's one of the dragons eating all their food and getting comfy in its house. Hey, look at this, she said. We peered down to where she saw. Sorry, we peered down to where she was now, pointing on the ground sheet of the tent. All around the little purple dragon were patches of ice. The delicate crystals formed into amazing patterns, almost like the creature had been painting a picture in frost. The dragon stretched up, drew back her wings and let out another freezing breath, swinging her head from side to side and it built up icy markings. She's an artist like me, said Cat with obvious delight. Kai snorted, but before they could launch into a full-on argument, I noticed something. Look what your one's done, Ted. We all looked to the furthest corner, where there was a mound of what looked like cotton wool. But we soon realised that it was the downy inside of Ted's sleeping bag. That means like the fluff, the soft bit inside a quilt or inside a sleeping bag. It had been ripped open. The golden dragon was now happily shredding Grandad's tent, its needle-sharp claws and teeth tearing into the material, and he had already made a fair-sized hole. How are we going to explain that one, said Ted. Never mind about that, said Kai. Where's my dragon? Now that's the end of chapter 25. What's really interesting in that chapter is that we all made a bit of a prediction that these dragons might kind of have different powers and lots of you said that the one with the spikes like icicles would um, be like an ice dragon and you were right what brilliant predictions so we're on chapter 26 poor guppy we all stared at the hole in the tent the dragon sized hole making sure flicker and the other dragons were safely in their shoe boxes we crawled out of the tent and started hunting. But it was properly dark now. It's no good, said Cat after several minutes. We'll have to wait until it's light. He'll have flown away by then, said Kai, in a full-on sulk. Typical. Cat gets the artist and I get the escape artist. We piled back in the tent, Kai still muttering unhappily. As we all squashed back inside the tent, Ted suddenly howled. Oh, stop it! Stop what? We haven't touched you, I said. Someone's just pulled my hair. You must have caught it on something, said Cat. Oh, stop it! That hurts! Ted rubbed his head crossly and glared at each of us in turn. We can't blame us, I piped up. You can see we're right here. Ted looked about him, confused. Keep very still, said Kai suddenly. Ted froze in horror, obviously wondering what nasty nighttime creature Kai was about to save him from. He wasn't the bravest when it came to bugs and beasties, which may have stemmed from the time when Leon dropped tadpoles in his milk. We all sat there watching as Kai leaned forward and reached up above Ted's head to where the lantern was hanging. Got you, he said with a laugh. And there in his hand was his dragon. Only he wasn't greeny blue with peacock markings anymore. He was the exact shade of red as the lantern. Cool, said Kai, cradling the dragon with an expression of admiration. Mine can go undercover, the ultimate camouflage. 
we learned an important lesson right there. All dragons are not the same, not by a long shot. I wasn't sure how any of us were going to sleep, but eventually the dragons curled up in their shoe boxes. As the others settled down, I watched Flicker, his scales rippling through a kaleidoscope of colours, and then I must have dropped off as well, because the next thing I knew, it was light and someone was yelling. Is, is that your granddad? Kat asked me, rubbing the sleep from her eyes. He sounds really mad. I'd never heard granddad raise his voice, let alone shriek like that. There's a lovely pitch now of all the dragons in their shoe boxes. I shook my head. I don't think so. Keep hold of the dragons, I hissed. I'm taking a look. I unzipped the tent and peered out. Grandad was standing on the front step. Lolly tucked behind his legs in the open doorway and planted in front of him was the fuming inferno that was grim. That old place trashed, that blooming kid. I told you he was trouble, he bellowed. Honestly, that horrible man. How could he shout at Grandad like that? I pictured the swarm of dragons we had seen last night and how they had shredded, uprooted and devoured whatever they could find before taking, before taking off and flying goodness knows where. Grim must have woken up and found the devastation and of course come straight here to blame me for everything. Without stopping to think, I stormed out of the tent towards him. Hey, it wasn't us, I shouted. Lolly wriggled past Grandad and toddled towards me. She wrapped her, her arms around my legs and clung on tight. With me off camping, Mum and Dad had bought her for a sleepover too, taking the chance for a night out. But the rumpled up frown on her face told me this angry shouting man wasn't fitting in with her plans for the morning at all. Guppy sad, she whispered, pointing her finger at Grandad. Poor Guppy. Now then, let's just calm ourselves down, came Grandad's voice. It's probably foxes or brat badgers. Why not come in for a cuppa and we'll see if we can get to the bottom of this, shall we? How he kept so cool in the face of all that yelling, I don't know. He deserves a medal, my granddad. Grim was not so cool. He turned and pointed a finger at me, as if he imagined lighting, lightning fire could come from the tip of it. And I almost thought it could. Fox is my foot. I've already caught him in my garden once. He'll have been up there again. You can bet on that. What's this, Thomas? Grandad asked. Didn't tell you about that, did he? said Grim. I told you he was trouble. Grandad looked over at me. I wasn't doing anything, I spluttered. I thought I saw something attacking his vegetables, that's all. Grandad obviously didn't know quite what to make of his, this new information. Well, like he says, I'm sure he wasn't up to anything, said Grandad still keeping his voice nice and quiet. And as for right now, Thomas has been camping in our garden with a few of his friends. They've been tucked up in their tent the whole time, haven't you, Chipstick? Although I knew it wasn't us that had caused all the mess, I couldn't bear to look Grandad in the eye, not after the fact that we'd sneaked out. Grim turned his laser vision on my mud-splattered boots and trousers and then fired his lightning finger at them. Proof. A look of triumph lit up his face. Grandad's eyes dropped and also took in the muddy evidence. And suddenly I saw his shoulders sag, like he was one of those giant, bobbling, inflatable Santas at Christmas and someone had come up and let the air out of him, just enough so his head flopped and wobbled a bit. And to be honest, that felt even worse than if he'd yelled at me because you know that twinkle I told you about, the one that makes Grandad's face light up? Well, it had gone. Honestly, Grandad, it wasn't us, I pleaded. Grim glared at me and set off across the grass towards the tent. Are the rest of them in there? He growled. The noise had woken the dragons and I could hear Ted, Cat and Kai wrestling to keep them in. 
Before Grimm could pull the flap open, one side of the tent began to bulge, and then another, and then something shot out of the hole Ted's dragon had chewed, followed by two more flitting shapes. Thankfully, Grimm was bending down, preparing to thrust his head in through the entrance, and Grandad had turned to scoop Lolly up, so no one apart from me noticed them. They did, however, notice what happened next. You couldn't really miss that. I'm going to leave it there. Our last chapter is called Flaming Cabbages and it's chapter number 27 and that is our last chapter of the book. So I'll record that one for you tomorrow. I hope you enjoyed a little bit of our story. Stay safe, take care and I'll see you tomorrow.